And if we assume the fluid is an ideal gas, which we haven't done so far, um, then we know from the ideal gas law that the density is equal to the pressure divided by RT. And also we have the velocity in terms of the Mach number and the speed of sound, which for an ideal gas is square root of KRT. If we substitute these expressions, the ideal gas law and the velocity in terms of the speed of sound into the continuity equation, we get the following. If we now um, rearrange this equation and solve for the area ratio, A2 over A1, and substitute in our isentropic expressions for the temperature and uh, pressure ratios, then we get the following. Okay, if we now take that expression that we just wrote down and set the Mach number one, set it to one, and set the cross-sectional area A1 to A star, which is a hypothetical critical Mach uh, cross-sectional area. In other words, it's the cross-sectional area in the duct where the Mach number is one we can drop the subscript two and obtain the following expression. That A anywhere in the duct divided by the critical cross-sectional area A star is equal to one over the Mach number anywhere in the duct times two K plus one, one plus K minus one over two, the Mach number any location in the duct squared all to the k plus one over two to the k minus one power. Now this is a super important relationship we use all the time. So we'll box it in red and it's equation 1193. And you can see it plotted down here on the left, the ratio of the cross-sectional area at any location in the duct to the critical cross-sectional area versus Mach number, right? And so what you see is down here at a Mach number of one, that ratio A over A star is one, just as you would expect. And just one other note, often if you're solving a problem and you're, it's a compressible flow through a variable area duct. It could be supersonic, subsonic flow. Um, and you want an area ratio A2 over A1 for just two different locations in the duct. You can express that in terms of ratios of A over A star. And that's useful because, um, because of table DI, which tabulates A over A star, right? So I'm just going to put a little note, CF table um, D dot I, the isentropic uh, flow relationships, and that tabulates A over A star as a function of Mach number. All right, if the fluid is an ideal gas, 
we can write the mass flow rate in the following way. This is 1196. We can rewrite this equation that we've just written down in terms of stagnation properties. And then it looks like m dot is equal to square root of k um, stagnation pressure times area over the square root of r times the stagnation temperature times the Mach number 1 plus k plus 1 over 2 Mach number squared to the minus k plus 1 over 2 k minus 1 power. And this is 1197 in the textbook. Uh, and then finally, setting the Mach number equal to 1 and a equal to a star, we get the following version of the mass flow rate. And this is equation 1198 in your textbook. Okay, finally, if we take that equation we just wrote down 1198 and we non dimensionalize it to get the non dimensional mass flow rate, we get the following. They're all pretty useful, so we'll box these all in red. And then finally, this last one is equation 1199. All right. So, um, when we have flow in a converging, diverging nozzle, we've, we've rewritten this expression here for the non-dimensional mass flow rate, right? Um, and we plot this down here on the bottom left. This is the mass flow function versus the Mach number. What we see is that uh, for that critical case where the Mach number is equal to one, the mass flow rate just depends on K, right? Only K doesn't depend on, you know, the exit pressure, uh, you know, the pressure difference between the entrance and the exit. In fact, you can drop the exit pressure, continue to drop it, have a larger and larger Delta P across the nozzle and it won't increase the mass flow rate anymore. And this phenomenon is called choked flow. Um, and it occurs when the Mach number at the throat, that minimum cross-sectional area in your nozzle is one. So let's look at an example. Here we've got gas entering a rocket engine nozzle with a stagnation pressure of 1500 kilopascals and a stagnation temperature of 3000 degrees Celsius. The rocket's traveling in the um, still standard atmosphere at 30,000 meters altitude. So what are the throat and the exit area 
for this rocket. So the throat again is that minimum cross-sectional area in your converging diverging nozzle. Um, and the exit plane is of course, you know, as the gas leaves the rocket, the nozzle and enters the atmosphere. So assume that it's a gas with a ratio of specific heats K of 1.35, not 1.4, so this is not air, uh, and a gas constant of 287 Newton meters per kilogram Kelvin, and that the gas is perfectly expanded to the ambient pressure. And so what that means is that um, as it exits into the atmosphere, that exit pressure at the exit plane is atmospheric pressure. All right, well, first things first, to find the um, static pressure at an altitude of 30 kilometers, we turn to table C2. Which tabulates the US standard atmosphere versus altitude. And we find that the pressure is 1.197 kilopascals in the US standard atmosphere at that altitude. So that's our static pressure. Okay. Then assuming isotropic process um, at the exit, we can write down our equation for the ratio of static to stagnation pressure. Um, and then by equation 11.51, we know that this is also equal to 1 plus k minus 1 over 2, the Mach number at the exit squared, Um, to the k minus 1 over k power, right? We can then rearrange this and solve for the exit Mach number. And then plugging in the values we have, we've got 2 over 0.35, 1 over 7.98 times 10 to the minus 4, 2 to 0.35 over 1.35 power minus 1. square root and we get the Mach number is 5.53 so very supersonic almost hypersonic range um, actually in the hypersonic range right so Mach number above five now since the Mach number um, at the exit is supersonic we know that the Mach number at the throat must be sonic um, so then the area of the throat is the critical area, A star. Okay. 
Okay. Now we take these mass flow relationships. So we'll write down equation 11.98 that we just derived. which gives us the mass flow rate in terms of the stagnation um, and critical properties. So we've got stagnation pressure times A star over the square root of R T naught, square root of K two over K plus one, K plus one, two over K minus one, or rearranging to solve for A star, uh, we have the following expression and then plugging in the numbers that we have at 10 kilograms per second times the square root of 287 newton meter per kilogram kelvin times 32.73 kelvin over 1500 times 10 to the third pascals times the square root of 1.35 times 2.35 over two, um, all raised to the 2.35 over two times 0.35 power. And this gives us finally that A star is equal to 9.56 times 10 to the minus third meters squared. And this is equal to the area of the throat as well. Okay, finally, so if you remember, we were asked to find the throat and exit area. So we've just found the throat area. Now we need to find the area of the exit plane of the nozzle. So we go back to this um, equation that we derived earlier in this lecture that gives us the ratio of A over A star, and we use that equation. And that's equation 11.93. And now we've got AE, the exit area over A star, is equal to 1 over the exit Mach number, 2 plus K plus 2 uh, over K plus 1, 1 plus K minus 1 over 2, exit Mach number squared. Plus one over two k minus one. All right, now plugging in the values we have nine point five six times ten to the minus third meters squared over five point five three our Mach number over two. 2.35, 1 plus 0.35 over 2, 5.35 squared, 2.35.7. We get that our exit area is 2.81 times. 10 to the minus 1 meters squared. All right. So just to talk a little bit about um, 
how we approach this problem. We had a converging diverging nozzle. Um, we know, we assume that inside the rocket engine, the air is being accelerated from zero, right? And so the question is, does it reach sonic conditions, Mach number equals one at the throat and then continue accelerating to the exit or does it stay subsonic the whole way through? So the first thing we did was calculate the Mach number at the exit and find that, that it was supersonic, right? Since it was supersonic the exit, we knew that the Mach number at the throat was one. Um, and then we went ahead and calculated, uh, use this equation for the mass flow rate, rearranged it and solved for A star, and then used that to solve for A exit. Okay, so in general, the flow through a converging nozzle, um, not converging diversing, but converging for compressible flow, um, is set up like this. So we've got um, some tank full of stagnant gas with stagnation pressure and temperature, and it then passes through a converging nozzle with an area AE at the exit plane, and the rate at which it flows is set by the back pressure PV, right? And at the exit plane, we've got a Mach number, sub E, an exit Mach number, and exit pressure, right? And we've got this dimensionless mass flow rate. And if we look down here on the bottom right, we see our dimensionless mass flow rate is constant for a range of values of the back pressure over the stagnation pressure, right? So that basically, if we look at the setup here, our schematic, we've got one pressure, a stagnation pressure here before the nozzle and then a back pressure after the nozzle and that pressure is controlled by this control valve here. So for a certain ratio of those two end pressures, we have just a constant mass flow rate. But then when the back pressure goes above the stagnation pressure, um, above half the stagnation pressure, then the mass flow rate starts to fall off. Now, when we have a converging diverging nozzle, we still have a tank uh, before the nozzle where the gas is stagnant, and then we've got a back pressure that drives the flow. Um, here, because we've got a minimum cross-sectional area, we can either have subsonic flow all the way through, or the flow can get accelerated to a Mach number of one at the throat at that critical A star, um, and then either continue to accelerate downstream if it's supersonic flow or drop back down to subsonic, depending on the ratio, again, of your back pressure to stagnation pressure. So the example we looked at was the shock regime where the flow is subsonic and the convergent portion reached a Mach number of one at the throat and then accelerated until the exit of our converging diverging nozzle where we had a Mach number of 5.5 through three. But in general, there are four different scenarios for converging diverging nozzle. The Venturi regime where the flow is subsonic everywhere through the nozzle. The shock regime where it's subsonic up to the throat and then supersonic, um, but we have a standing shock somewhere in the diverging portion after the throat, right? Um, in this regime, the flow is choked. And if you remember, that means that it doesn't matter how much more you drop the back pressure, you can't increase the flow rate through the nozzle. It's constant. And then we've got two other regimes, an overexpanded and underexpanded regime. These are basically the same flow accelerates throughout the nozzle. So it accelerates from zero to a Mach number of one at the throat and then continues to accelerate. And when it reaches the exit plane, um, it is 
overexpanded. So the pressure is below atmospheric pressure and it fans out as it exits. But then the atmospheric pressure compresses the jet, right? And then underexpanded regime is the same thing, but as it leaves the exit plane supersonically, um, it's at a lower pressure, it's at a higher pressure than atmospheric, and so it fans out. The case we looked at in our example was perfectly expanded, and that meant that the exit pressure matched atmospheric pressure. All right, one more thing that I want to show you um, is this really cool diamond shock pattern that you can get when you have supersonic flow exiting a converging diverging nozzle. In this particular case here, we've got a methane rocket engine and uh, the flow is accelerated to supersonic. It's supersonic at the exit. And you have just the right flow conditions that you get this standing shock pattern, this diamond shock pattern where you have, um, you have flow that exits and it gets compressed by the atmospheric air, but then it goes through a re-expansion uh, shock wave, and then it gets through a recompression shock wave, and then re-expansion and re-compression, and get this nice diamond pattern here. So I'm going to switch back over. Um, to my desktop and we will play this movie. And you'll be able to see this in action. All right, so pretty impressive. You can read more about diamond shock patterns here on the Wikipedia page. And just a couple of notes uh, going forward. So Hyungun's final um, office hours and problem solving sessions are this week, so this Thursday and Friday. This, these are the problems that he'll be going over this Friday. So these are his, the problems he's going over in his final problem solving session. Reminder that your video project presentations, the drafts, are due this Friday at midnight. Um, you'll get feedback on those drafts and you can use those, uh, that feedback for your final presentation. Quiz 13, homework 13 are due after Thanksgiving break. Um, just another reminder that you decide the topic of the final lecture in the course, which is the Monday after Thanksgiving break. And then two, day, two days later, the Wednesday after Thanksgiving break, you've got midterm three. Um, it covers everything from what was covered on midterm two up through today um, and homework and quiz 13. And then finally, the last three class sessions that we'll have, so Friday, December 4th, Monday, December 7th, and Wednesday, December 9th, the last day of class, will be the video project presentations. All right, that wraps up this lecture. I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving break, and we will see you soon.